Jesus Christ, you died, you came for us, you gave up your life for me, for us. And today we put all of our hope in you. We don't put it in things of this world. We don't put it in humans. We don't put it in governments. We don't put it in, in things that we see here. But we believe in you, God, the creator of all things. And we worship you today. You overcame. And Lord, we know that you give us the ability to overcome as well. And so today we come here seeking you. We pray for your presence, your fire within us, that you would burn in us, Lord. Right now we ask you, is there anything in us that shouldn't be there? Lord, take it from us. Forgive us, Lord, for the things that we've said, the things that we've done that are wrong, that were hurtful, that were impure. Lord, help us to be clean. Make us whole. Lord, for those that feel broken and, and just feel like they could never be enough. I ask you, Lord, to bring them to wholeness. Right now, Lord, we come to you knowing that we can't do these things on our own. We need you. Come. Come on this Pentecost Sunday. Start a fire within us that cannot be contained your passions, your desire, your, your strength, your boldness. Come, Lord. Be still before our Lord today and know that he is good. As we're still before the Lord here for a moment, just, just seek him. And as you do, I'm just going to ask, is there anybody today that just, maybe you've been wandering from God, you've kind of strayed your own way or off the path that you should have, and you know that God's calling you back and, and wants to welcome you with open arms. And today you need to just say, God... Forgive me. If that's you, just lift up your hand and let me pray with you today. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. He's here. Right now, God is here. And he forgives you. Your act of raising your hand and saying, God, I want to be forgiven. It's a free gift. It's free. He just forgave you. And Lord, we pray that you would come into their lives, that they would know you, you would know them. You would be joined together. That, Lord, you would begin something new in their life today and that they would know it. That on this Pentecost Sunday, June 5th, 22, you began a new work in their life. We praise you, Lord, for being here. We know you're here. The Bible also teaches us to pray and seek him and 
It says that there is any among us that are sick, that we should gather the elders around them, lay hands on them and pray for them, anoint them with oil. And I'm just wondering, is there anybody today that just feels led like you're sick or there's something going on in your life that you would like us to pray for you about? We could pray for you now. Together here, we're going to take communion. And if you're taking that with us today, it is a time of remembrance of what Jesus has done for us. It's also a sign of commitment that you are going to uh, live for Jesus and that he lives in you. And even if you just made that decision now, we invite you to take this with us. I invite you to take the bread, the wafer with me right now, And the Apostle Paul wrote in Corinthians chapter 11, he says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Right now, I just want to give thanks to Jesus for the bread. I thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated if you like, uh, but we just thank you, Jesus, for the bread. We thank you, Lord, that you are our bread. We thank you that you will always be everything we need. You will sustain us and get us through. Thank you. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving your life, your body, and that it was broken for us. I thank you for that, Lord. Let's break it and eat it together in remembrance of Jesus. Paul went on to explain to them, he said, in the same way he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance as me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for the blood that you shed. We thank you, Lord, for paying for our sins, for taking our place on the cross. We thank you, Lord, that no matter how bad we have been, no matter what things we have done, that, Lord, your blood can cover us all cover all of our sins. And today we celebrate what you did. We celebrate who you are and we give you thanks. Let's take and drink together of the cup in remembrance of Jesus. Oh Lord God, we just wanna thank you and praise you. You are good, you are faithful, you are loving and compassionate even when we were sinners, you loved us. We thank you for being here with us this morning and thank you for the words you're about to share with us. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Again, we just want to say welcome. We're so glad that all of you are here with us today. Uh, We have a special treat today. God is going to speak through... um, someone else. Uh, Jazzily Giannis has um, spent the last semester in Papua New Guinea, and uh, she has come to share with us uh, what God did to her and through her and around her during that time. And so would you help me welcome Jazzy? Good morning, everybody. <laughs> it's so good to be here this morning. Awesome. Right this forward. 
Before I get started, um, I just want to give a big thank you to everyone here in this room um, and the different ways that my church family has supported me in the big and the little things. Um, even just being here this morning and seeing all of you guys, that is, um, it just means the most to me. And so I thank you for your love and support and, and just everything. And um, yeah, I was in Papua New Guinea for um, four months for a school internship. Um, I go to Liberty University, um, and I was with the organization Ethnos 360. And so for some context, for some of you, if you don't know where Papua New Guinea is, don't feel bad. I didn't either. It sits right on top of Australia. It's connected to Indonesia, um, but it is its own country of its own. And so um, that's where I was for four months. It was an incredible time. I learned so much of the culture, the language, um, and a little bit of Papua New Guinea, they have over 850 different language groups. So if you know a little bit about language and culture, that's a lot for just a little space of land like that. Um, and so, um, yeah, <laughs> that was a lot. But this is Emma. I don't know if she's watching right now, but Emma, if you're there, I love you. Um, we were able to experience this trip together. She is also a Liberty student, and so um, she's now family. She's my sister in Christ. She's your sister in Christ. Um, and so when I say we, that's usually who I'm referring to, Emma and I. And so this is where I was. If you could see that orange star up there, that's Medang, Papua New Guinea. That's where I stayed most of my time at a missionary um, base there, Ethnos's uh, mission base there. They have a few around the country. Um, one is in Kimbe, which is on the right in the islands of Papua New Guinea, um, and Goroka as well, which is another little blue star. And there's also um, the star of Godipuk, which was a church plant in the middle of the jungle that I was able to visit. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later as well. Um, so as a part of the, uh, my time in Papua New Guinea with Ethnos, I was able to kind of just dive into the language learning, which is the core of the training there. It's called the E2 program. So you can see some, oops, some, <laughs> okay. <laughs> there is um, some of our, um, honestly, family in Christ, that they are um, training to be church planters in Papua New Guinea. So on the left, that's Karis and Jacob and their three little kiddos. Um, next to me and Karis, there's Rachel. She is a single. And um, honestly, it was awesome to get to know uh, the three of them and um, to see how the Lord has used them and is teaching them still today. They are... Um, yeah, they're incredible, and they taught me personally so much of what it looks like to follow Christ and to be committed to his great commission um, in the jungles of Papua New Guinea. So it was just five of us in the training. It was a very, very small group compared to uh, other groups prior. And in the middle there, you can see David and Robin. They were our supervisors, kind of like my mom and dad on the field. Um, they were just there to answer a lot of questions, and they were very, very wise and kind and yeah, <laughs> hopefully I'll see him again soon, sooner than later. And then on the right, that's Jay, uh, Ray, sorry, Ray and Jessica, and they um, were have already gone through the training, and so they were kind of there to um, support us in in just um, those who are you know right behind them. So it was really fun to get to know them and to meet them. Um, <laughs> so language learning I always included a notebook pencil and a phone to record and take pictures. And so I took these three things with me everywhere I went while I was in Papua New Guinea because once you start decide to learning language and culture, you will realize that you could literally ask a question about every single little thing. And so this picture kind of reminds me of um, the day that I took this picture. I was with Rachel and our PNG friend, and they were in a um, more advanced conversation, and I remember taking that picture and being like, okay, when I look back on this, I'm gonna remember that um, I worked hard because I remember just like writing everything down and like, you know, not even having time to ask the questions, but um, it was fun to look back through my journals and notebooks to realize how much I did learn and grow in Talk Pigeon. Sorry, I should have mentioned that earlier. We were learning Talk Pigeon, also known as Talk Pisin, also known as English Pigeon, um, and so, 
yeah, that was the language that we learned there. A little bit about Pidgin. Um, it is a man-made language, not a God-made language. It was uh, made for trade for the people of Papua New Guinea, considering there are over 850 language groups, um, plus outside influences. So they kind of created a language so that um, man could communicate during trading and all that stuff. So that's what we learned. Um, so language learning took place in the village. Here are some awesome ladies that I got to meet. Um, and spend time with. I remember this day I was asking them about their music and their dancing and it ended up to me ending up in one of their sing-sing traditional outfits, which is what they use to, to dance and to sing in. And so that was a really fun day. Uh, this is Jenny. This day she was teaching me on how she smokes tobacco. I did not try it. Don't worry. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, honestly, this picture reminds me of, again, the very smallest things, they're still culture. Like this paper right here, if someone from an unknown foreign country would come here and would see this and be like, well, why is it like this? And like, why is there a box here? And why is there quotation marks? And why is there slashes in the dates? And why is the font different and all that stuff, right? So it was kind of a humbling moment to realize. I remember this day was very early on in my language learning and I was like, I know nothing. I thought I knew what it looked like to smoke, <laughs> but I don't. <laughs> so there is smoke and tobacco for you with Jenny. Um, language learning in town, honestly, was more observations than anything else. Um, I was able to just write down what I saw. Um, and I also was writing a research project as a part of my um, classes that I was doing um, during my internship. And my research ethnography paper was on PNG women's views on modesty. And so places like town and in the markets um, were really good places where I was able to um, observe the women there specifically and how they interact with each other, how people sell things, what they sell, um, and all the things in between. So it was really fun to just observe. It was kind of one of my favorite things to do when out and about. Language learning on the weekends, even on days off of language learning, we still, again, always found something to talk about, to ask about. Um, I don't know if you can see it very well, but there's a canoe in the middle, um, which was something, um, the Nambis life, which is the coast life, was something that I got to learn a lot about because our base was right there on the coast of Medang. And I just remember being so clueless on how everything worked on the Nambis. So I remember taking this picture on a day that we went swimming in the Pacific and just being like, wow, like um, I have so much to learn and I still do. Um, language learning with food, lots and lots of food. Right here we're cooking some kumu, also known as greens, any type of veggie green, that's what um, we refer to uh, with kumu. Um, which made some of language learning easier. Um, this is Marta. This day she taught us how to make PNG donuts. She also taught us how to make rice baskets and grass mats that day. So we got to do a lot of fun things like that. And I love Marta. I, again, I pray one day I can see her, see her sooner than later, see her on this earth before I see her in heaven because um, she's just a ball of joy and always finding something to teach us and laugh about. So that was fun. This is my other Marta. She was sharing some of her fruit of her tree outside her home this day. Um, usually PNG people will just climb trees, but <laughs> she had, a, she had a, a ladder that day, and so I thought it was fun to take a picture like, oh, I recognize that, because <laughs> I didn't climb any trees during my time there. <laughs> I would probably have fallen. Um, this is sweet Christina. She was teaching us how to make sack sack. So, Sack sack is a traditional PNG food. Um, I don't know if you can see from the picture, but it is like a jelly consistency. It smells just like it tastes, um, which is kind of like a vinegar, like a very sour vinegar. I tried it. Um, they love it. I don't, and that's okay. <laughs> but um, it was fun to try new things all the time, and. Um, this is a picture of us in Godipuk, which was one of the uh, church plants that we got to visit in the jungle. And this was, I didn't get to catch her name, but this was a, a PNG girl that was um, 
help, letting us help her, honestly, uh, to prepare sac sac. So what sac sac is, is the inside of a sago tree. So they cut, like it's a huge tree, and they cut it down, and the, they cut it down, they cut it down the middle, and then they kind of like rake out the insides. It's almost like the inside bark of a tree. And they put that um, consistency in these woven baskets and then they add water. And so what I'm doing there is I'm squeezing it, um, all the liquid that's coming out from, that, um, from the things inside the tree. And in that um, little thing at the bottom, um, it'll create a thin layer of like a fat-like substance. And that is sac sac. So, and they use sac sac to make a bunch of different kinds of foods. and. Um, so the, the picture prior is one way to make sac sac, which is sac sac soup. Um, there's some more kumu, uh, cutting some kumu with Mikey. Um, Mikey's mom, Rita, she was super pregnant at this time, and so we were able to go to her house um, a certain day that I took these pictures and just to help her make the most delicious meal um, that I had eaten, that I ate there. Um, it was like a traditional tin fish rice coconut kumu um, plate, and it was, I still, I dreamed about it the other day, it was really weird. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was, it was sweet to get to know Mikey and her mom, Rita, and um, sh she gave birth to her baby the day after we left, and I was so sad I didn't get to meet her baby, but um, it was fun to see her, you know, in the process of pregnancy, and yeah. Um, language learning, even while plucking chickens. This day, we, we watched eight different chickens being killed, and we plucked them all, and we ate them like 10, like, sorry, not 10, like four hours later. Um, so yeah, in Papua New Guinea, people cook on barrels. They cook on the ground, oops, or in the ground. Um, this is a mumu, that's some of the, in the aluminum is some of that chicken that you just saw. <laughs> and so this is a mumu, and so what they do in a mumu is they put these hot rocks, super hot, hot, hot rocks, and they put the food on top, they put more rocks on top, and it's kind of like a repeated process until it creates this sort of mountain, and the food just cooks, and it is absolutely delicious. Language learning with kids. Um, I soon came to find out that kids love white people. <laughs> they love trying to see what the white person has to say or what they're asking or what they're doing. And so when we would come visit them, usually it would end in a trail of them just like following us around the village. Uh, that day I was trying to find a, um, a garden of a language, um, language helper that day. And I just turned around, I remember seeing like 20 kids behind me and I was like, whoa! And so those were the kids that had stuck with me as I was walking back <laughs> to uh, the base. And there's Emma on the left with some of the um, older kids that were helping us out and they're very, very helpful, very honest. They will question you on your pronunciation and be like, that's not how you say that. So it was fun to, to be humbled in that way with their honesty. And they're always finding something to laugh and to smile about. Language learning with Margaret. Um, right there in the middle, that's my friend Margaret. Um, on a more serious note, Margaret is part of the statistic of 70% of Papua New Guinean women who are beaten by their husbands. And so join me in prayer for Margaret and women like her in Papua New Guinea who, um, as a part of their married life, they, they deal with this um, on a regular and yeah, pray that the Lord would change this part of their culture for the good and you can see her smiling there, right? Every time I would talk to her or I would go to ask her for some questions on language, um, she was always finding something to smile about, but behind those eyes, I could just see a lot of pain. So join me in prayer for people like Margaret. Um, this is Kobina. She is one of literally the strongest PNG women I will probably ever meet. She cut down a banana tree with one chop. <laughs> I saw it. It was. I, oh my gosh. I love Kovina. I was able to um, interview her as well as a part of my um, ethnography research. And so this day she was really able to share with me a very raw and vulnerable story of her and um, some persecution that she went through with the church um, on some just like workspace things um, that she got kicked, she got kicked out of a church. If you had read some of my updates, um, if you had received them, I wrote a little bit of, about her and her story that she was able to share with me. Um, and so this is Kovina, and I remember 
Um, the day before we left, we came to see her while she was finishing work. Um, and she looked at me with tears in her eyes and said, suppose me no looking me long this la ground, me sabe me looking me long heaven. And so what she told me was, if I don't see you on this earth anymore, <laughs> I know I'll see you in heaven. And yeah, it's awesome to be able to share with you guys this morning some of these faces who are your brothers and sisters in Christ, who might look different than you, who might walk and talk different than you, but we still share the same God, and God has reached their hearts, and it was incredible to get to know them during my time there. Oopsie. This is um, RVA, so Ruma Valley Academy. It was a school that was part of the base um, that we stayed on. Um, these are some of the kids there. Um, this is seventh and eighth grade that Kelly on the right, she's a missionary, um, was a church planting um, missionary, kind of has finished the work, has stayed in PNG with her husband Bill, and are now um, barely starting the school that are filled with um, bush kids and town kids. And so um, this is a mix of students who are from town and from the jungles of Papua New Guinea, some of them from the tribe that she worked in. And um, they've started the school for seventh and eighth graders, but their ages range from 14 to 24. Um, and so education is not very valued in Papua New Guinea. And so there's a lot of people who just would never finish 12th, past 12th grade and they're trying to go against the current. And so pray for Kelly and for Bill and for RVA. Um, if you're interested in getting to know more information about that, they're looking for um, missionaries to come serve with them. I would love to answer some questions. So just come up to me whenever and um, they're on Facebook too. So feel free to look them up. Um, I learned a lot from RVA and from their wonderful RVA staff. That's Marissa, Lucy, Kelly, and Stephanie. Those are the staff they're working for right now. Um, this is RVA on the left. Uh, these are the guys playing Uno and Skipbo. And just a fun picture. I think if you ever look up PNG people on the internet, you sometimes you won't always see them smiling. <laughs> they look a little scary, a little serious sometimes, but once you just start a relationship, a conversation, they'll just light up and they love to laugh and they love to smile. And um, so that's a fun picture of them. I really like that picture of them on the right, especially with the boys in the back going like this. <laughs> and so these are some of the girls that we got to meet. This was um, the day before we left as well. And yeah, goodbyes are hard. I'm excited to see him in heaven. Um, this was the day we went to go clean the community um, with RVA, a lot of broken bottles, a lot of um, um, buai, which is kind of like the traditional drug, I guess is the best way to explain that. A lot of people chew, um, kind of causes people's teeth to go red. Um, I'm sure you may maybe you saw, I think Margaret had, had red teeth in that picture that I showed earlier, and so um, causes cancer, mm, it's a bit of a hallucinogenic drug. Um, mild for some, stronger for others. Um, so there's a lot of that that we had to pick up. And yeah, it was fun to, to get to do that with them that day. This is RVA singing in the villages on Easter weekend. Um, there's a song that they sang, I believe it's by Phil Wickham. And I, I'll never forget it because it's just one of those songs that like, well, I will always associate with PNG. And it goes, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we will sing and shout the victory. And so I just like, when I see this picture, I just like envision them singing this. Um, and I loved it, loved it, it was really nice. So this is Mikey, um, Marta, and Jinjin, and we got to spend some solid time with these girls. Um, there's Eileen in the blue too. <laughs> They were just very, very sweet, and um, they were um, children of families that are very associated with the base, and so they were on the base all the time. They would come in. We would get to share with them a lot of the time. We'd let them draw and like tape it on our walls, so that was always fun. And just to see, like, as young girls, where their heart is with the Jesus and how they're just inclined to him. And so pray for these girls that they would continue to love and follow the Lord. Um, so we were able to serve through hanging out with some MKs, missionary kids, while mom and dad are on their first day in over a year. <laughs> and we were also able to serve through childcare during a missionary conference in the islands of Papua New Guinea. That was where Kimbe was and one of the pictures um, I first showed. Um, 
another a few pictures of some fun days that we had in town. Um, yeah, this was really fun. I remember if you see that blue starfish, we spent like all day <laughs> trying to look for some blue starfish, and so it was fun to do it with our group of friends there. Yeah, they were a, they're always a joy to be around. Um, yeah, those are some of the girls on the right too. It was fun. This was also on Easter weekend, and we were able to uh, watch The Passion with our PNG friends. Um, we played it on a projector. You can't really see it. It's not the best picture, but you can kind of see the light on the right shining. It's a projector, and we put it on um, like a white sheet outside. If you can see like the bright light on the left, they have like a little market that Pauline, the women, um, lit up in white. And she owns that. It's right outside her home. And um, we were able to um, spend that night watching it with them. There's a bunch of little kids in the front there, too. And so it's, I remember when I watched it, I was like eight, and that's a hard movie to watch. So it was just interesting to see how you know, they reacted to it, too. And it, I mean, like for Easter weekend, it was, I, just, I just felt I sensed the Lord's presence that day afterwards and how it was just quiet. You know, A lot of people were just contemplating what the Lord had done for us, and um, it was beautiful to get to pray with them after and to just um, encourage them in their faith that way. So, Godipuk. This uh, was a planted church in the Godipuk tribal village of Papua New Guinea. Um, and I just want to remind you guys this morning that the Lord is working even in the jungles of Papua New Guinea. Um, I remember entering this church and just <laughs> crying. <laughs> I'm emotional, but like that I just felt the Lord's presence. It was just so strong and so sweet. Um, you can kind of see the pictures um, that kind of trail. They trailed around the room, and it was the story of Genesis. Um, and it was just a, a beautiful Thursday morning that I was able to go in there and just sense the Lord's presence that even in a place so foreign and so unknown that um, maybe most of you didn't know existed this morning, God is there and he is working and he has not stopped working. Since those very pictures on the left there, since Genesis, he has not stopped working. And so it's just incredible. I love this picture. I think it was one of my favorite moments on my internship that I got to experience. Um, during our time in Godipuk, we also learned to wash them clothes in the river, um, cooking with the tribal people there. Um, and after that trip, I think the Lord just kept reminding me that despite all our differences, people are truly more alike than we are different. Um, and it was just a reminder that I don't think I knew at the beginning of my internship, I felt like there was no way I could build a relationship with these people and there was no way that I could learn the language well enough to communicate, but God proved me wrong. And I love this picture. They had painted our faces and they were getting ready to say goodbye to us just after one day of getting to know these ladies that, um, yeah, the Lord allowed me to, to have this one day with them. And um, it was just fun to be a, um, a learner that day, to be the student that day. And so please pray for the people of Godipuk and the missionaries there. Um, pray that the Lord's love would continue to overwhelm this place. And I was also able to meet some other young women um, across um, sea, across the ocean. <laughs> uh, there is um, Brie and Victoria. And um, Victoria in the dress, she is from Canada. And Brie is an MK from Papua New Guinea. And they both um, want to dedicate their life to be missionaries in Papua New Guinea. And so it was really fun to, to hear their stories and just how different they were to ours and how they are family in Christ. They're your family in Christ, too. Um, and this right here is family. Each of these women in this picture um, gave their time, their energy, um, their food <laughs> for us to help us with what um, the Lord had us there to do was to learn language, learn culture, learn about them. And um, I don't think they know how um, much I learned from them about what it means to be humble and what it means to serve. And um, I'll start on the left there. There's Pauline, Amelia, Christina, there's Emma and I, Marta, Rita, Ruth, Covina, and Roswita, and Karis and her baby. Um, 
Yeah, and I love these women. They were able to help us so much with our time there. Um, and it was just awesome to be encouraged by them and um, how the Lord has touched their hearts and how he's continuing to work in their lives and in their families' lives. Oopsie. So this is a glimpse of above, God's creation. Papua New Guinea is, goes from mountains to Nambis, so it was incredible to get to go around to the islands, middle of the country, by the coast, to see just how much God has created in just this little chunk of land. Um, here's another picture of me uh, leaving the, uh, the islands. And this is a picture of us going um, home. I don't know, if, you can kind of see it from here. I love this picture. Um, it was the sun was setting and the stars were kind of just poking out from above. Um, and on these plane rides, I had a lot of time um, to spend with the Lord. And during this time, um, the Lord taught me a lot of different things. But it wasn't just during these plane rides um, that I was able to speak and talk and just listen from the Lord. And it is true. I got to do and see and learn and experience so many amazing things. But the very main thing that I learned during my time in Papua New Guinea was how to rest in the Lord. <laughs> a few days before I hopped on my first plane on the three-day journey to PNG, my Tia Mechi, who is here this morning, <laughs> she came up to me during my grandma's surprise birthday party. And as I was sharing with her some of my fearful emotions I was feeling during that time, she looked at me, and with her, point, her finger pointed on my heart, she said, I want you to read Psalm 91. Don't forget, look it up when you get home, and I want you to remember those truths throughout your internship. And Psalm 91 reads, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And at that time, I had no idea that these words would soon become the threaded theme throughout my internship. As I dwelled in the shelter of the Most High and rested in his shadow, the Lord continued to refine in me um, the disciplines of being his, in his word and being in prayer, the practice of Sabbathing and being in the posture of worship and through resting in him, he showed me something very specific that he wanted me and wants to keep refining in me. And that is loving others. And I hope this isn't new to you, brothers and sisters, but this morning I want to remind us that we as humans are all very, 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 very good at loving ourselves before we are good at loving others. We are very good at thinking about what is best for us, making what we want a priority, making what we need a priority, even if it means kicking people out of the way or aggressively honking at them to get there. We are obsessed with all the benefits life brings when the ne next paycheck comes in, when we can get our next day off, what food I'm craving to get, etc. We are so quick to think about ourselves and the things that belong to us. We are so quick to humanize God, to ask him questions such as, why did this happen to me? Why, are you, why did you make me like this? Why aren't you doing what I want you to do? Are you even there? And guess what? The disciples during Jesus' time were doing the same exact thing, maybe just in their cultural context. If you have your Bibles this morning, turn or click to John 13. When you're there, you can say amen. <laughs> it was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, 
took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured basin, sorry, he poured water into a basin and began to dry his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Verse 12 continues, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on their robes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now if you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Thank you, Lord, for your word. May it continue to refine us. When I was in Papua New Guinea, I spent a lot of time in these flip-flops. <laughs> these flip-flops are disgusting. <laughs> um, I would literally wear them every day to Papua New Guinea, um, in Papua New Guinea, um, and they're still really, really dirty, even after washing them a few times. But um, these sandals only show a glimpse of how dirty my feet themselves would get, especially on those rainy and muddy days. Many, if not most days, I would have to make sure that I would wash my feet before um, coming inside our home um, with the spigot outside our house. Um, yeah, I couldn't help but want to wash my feet. And so I remember reading this story sometime in my internship and for the first time ever, immediately associating the washing of my own feet to Jesus' story of washing his disciples' feet. And I couldn't help but think to myself, wow, I have literally never washed anyone's feet on my own. <laughs> but I don't think that's what Jesus was doing or saying in John 13. If that's what it was, Jesus would be creating a religious work-based ritual that would attempt to confirm our righteousness. We have enough of those. But that's not what he was doing. What Jesus was doing was giving us an example of what it means to serve. Jesus was showing us of what it looks like to be a servant. And as I sat with the Lord in John 13, he soon revealed to me that I'm just like his disciples. I'm selfish and I'm prideful in life. I have been washing my own feet much more than I have been washing others. I have put myself first much more than I have put others first. The Lord used my time in Papua New Guinea to show me more of my own ugly flesh-filled tendencies and it was painful, but looking back at the refining fire, I couldn't help now but to be thankful for it. And through it, the Lord helped me to see what it truly means to love and to serve others. And I truly felt um, that I was able to put that to practice <laughs> with Emma, with my E2 team, with my supervisors, with the PNG people, with my schoolwork, with the people back home, with my family. The Lord helped me lay down all my unmet expectations about what I thought my time in Papua New Guinea would look like. He humbled me and constantly reminding me that this internship was not about me. <laughs> it was about him. And it still is about him. During my time in Papua New Guinea, I didn't see anyone get saved. I didn't get to share the full gospel with anyone. I didn't get to see a baptism. I didn't get to experience these amazing supernatural miracles, but I did learn of what it looks like and what it feels like to rest in the shadow of the Almighty. And if that's all that I had learned during my four months in Papua New Guinea, it would have happened more than enough. And so I just want to conclude this time that I've had to share with you all this morning with these words. Dwelling in the shelter of the Most High will also keep you in a teachable position, which is the best position to be in, as you keep learning more about God and the ways that he wants to keep refining you. So rest. Rest in him. Remember who your God is. Remember who you are. You are called to be his servant, his hands and feet. Ask yourself if you consider it an honor to serve the Most High God. 
Ask yourself if you're not only a follower of Christ, of Christ, but a servant. Follow the example of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Serve him and serve others, just as he has called us to do. And remember, he calls us blessed if we do so. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for this time, Lord, this chance, Lord, this moment that you've given me to come up here and share, God. I give you thanks for every single person in this room um, who has taken their time just to be here, Father, um, to give me um, their listening ear just for a moment, God. I pray that something that I said may resonate with their heart this morning, Lord. I pray that you would continue to soften our hearts towards you, Father, that you would continue to remind us of how little we are, God, and how you have made us for plans and purposes, yes, Lord, but at the same time, we've, you've made us for your glory, Lord, and to serve you, Father. That is why we're here, to serve you, God. And I ask you that you would continue to um, reveal to us the ways that you've already given us these opportunities, God, that we might not just only pray for those opportunities, but open our eyes, God, to see the things that you've already given us, Lord, in different ways that we can serve and love others the way that you have served and loved us, Jesus. I thank you for what you did on the cross, Lord. I thank you for how you came, Lord, as a humble baby, Lord, and how you um, left this world as a broken, broken man. And I pray that we would continue to follow your example, Father, in the ways that um, we treat others, in the ways that we look at the world, God, that you would continue to humble us, Lord, and to remind us of how you see us, Father, <laughs> and that we are here to serve others, to serve you. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for this life that you've given us, God, a life of abundance, God, a life full of um, just beautiful things, Father, and we're sorry for the times that we don't thank you enough for them. Continue to keep us in a humble state, Lord. We love you, Father. Thank you for loving us first.